I'm Deborah Lamb. I'm the chairman of the Watch Hill Conservancy. And this is the last presentation for Landfair Live for 2022. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, first, I want to uh, ask by a raise of hands, who received their conservator newsletter? And did you all notice how beautiful it is? So Jocelyn has put together just a, a fantastic new team. We've got, we brought Hugh Markey in, who's one of our naturalists and educators out on Napa Tree, who's also a high school teacher and a beautiful writer. He's involved with helping us edit now. And we've brought in a new graphic design crew. And I think you can just see it. I mean, we've always had high quality articles, but um, this next level is really um, beautiful. So I'm glad that you've received it. If for some reason you didn't receive it, make sure that you give your address, your name, or your email to, uh, to the gals in the back, or to Jocelyn, or to Daniel, and um, we'll get one right out to you. It's a, it's a very cool issue. Um, uh, I have to thank a bunch of people who do this program for us. Um, those of you who have been with us for other uh, presentations this season, you have heard many of this, so, um, so I appreciate your patience through this. But first of all, we have to just give a big thank you to Janice Sassy, who is our program uh, developer. Uh, she does everything Landfear Live, from coming up with the ideas to extending the invitations to corralling people in and uh, pivoting when we get a change midstream. So, um, so thank you so much, Janice. We had a really terrific and interesting lineup this year. We always try to keep things varied so that uh, we push ourselves out of our comfort zone a little bit and we don't you know, do all birds all the time, um, which is if I was in charge, we'd probably do all birds all the time. Um, I wanna thank Jocelyn Leahy, our executive director, who's in charge of all things communication, hospitality, and we usually have a swag table up here. Um, so we have some very cool swag things. Some are spectacular, like Chap's book. And some are, you know, lighter, like a Watch Hill Conservancy Yeti. If you are interested in things like that, please contact the office, and we'll be happy to pair you with it. They're fun little stocking stuffers. Uh, uh, Chap's book is a beautiful Christmas gift if somebody doesn't have that yet. so. So think about that. And thank you, Jocelyn, for all your help with those things. Um, I want to thank Peter August uh, for being our host and our moderator all season. Peter's right up here, and you'll see him in just a few minutes. I want to thank Peter August and Daniel Cole, who's our Napa Tree Conservation Area Manager, for taking care of all, all of our IT and tech support issues. There's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, equipment and sound check stuff that they do all the time, as well as recording all of these uh, for viewership afterwards. And we have a tremendous post-event viewership. Uh, people hit it all the time. We're, we're constantly surprised. Things we did three years ago are still getting hit. So, um, so we love it, and we're so happy that, that that product is out there. That is one of the silver linings of COVID. You know, we didn't think to do those kinds of recordings. And in fact, it's just handy and wonderful for so many people. We have to thank Grant Simmons, who is a VP at the Conservancy, but is also our official chef. So please, hands together for Grant Simmons. I want to thank Tom Papadia, who does everything set up, breakdown, and clean up about this room and this, uh, really, our building. It does an amazing job. Um, Coastal Graphics has been doing our signage this year, and it's really been elegant, so thank you to Coastal Graphics. I want to thank the Watch Hill Conservancy Board and leadership. Many of you are here in the room tonight. If you are on the board or have served on the board in the past, Don Kelly, would you please raise your hand? Thank you all for all that you do to support the conservancy and to support our community it's tremendous um, i want to thank our condominium neighbors the residents who live here and the shopkeepers are very accommodating 
to have all of us here all the time and turn the world upside down for an evening. So, um, so thank you all to our good neighbors. And of course, we need to thank our sponsors. Um, this year was our fifth year of Land Fear Live, and I finally felt really confident that we had a super solid program. And we went out to the Westerly community and asked the business community and some of our residents if they were interested in supporting the program. It cost us a bunch to, uh, to carry this room, to offer this room at a very low cost to other not-for-profits and to do this programming, and we had a tremendous group show up for this. So please uh, just be patient with me. I'd really like to read all of their names. Uh, par our sponsors this year were Parsons Kellogg, Olympia Tea Room, WH2O, Michelli's Furniture, Randall Realty Compass, Hammond Housecraft, Watch Hill Garage, Watch Hill Yacht Club Cabana Group, Graysale Brewery, the Bob Valenti Family of Dealerships. We had an anonymous donor donating in honor of Fred Whittemore and Chat Barnes, our Watch Hill Conservancy pioneers, or at least two of them. Mary Ann and Brian Thompson, the Lamb family, and the ever generous with the Watch Hill Conservancy, the Alfred M. Roberts Jr. Charitable Foundation. So please put your hands together for all of our sponsors this year. Made a huge difference. And with that, lucky you, my remarks are over. I'd like to introduce uh, Peter August, who's the president of the Watch Hill Conservancy, and he will be our host and moderator this evening. Peter? Thank you, Deborah. Truth be told, we don't do all birds all of the time, but we do some birds some of the time. So, uh, and I, I really want to uh, emphasize that point that Deborah raised. Janice works so hard to put together a really diverse portfolio of topics, some on science, some on history, some on technology, just like the sign says. Um, and the turnouts that you have been um, giving all summer have been fantastic. So I want to um, thank all of you for your great attendance and, and support of this program. So tonight's speaker is Pierce Rafferty. Pierce is the director of the Henry L. Ferguson Museum on Fishers Island. The mission of the museum is the collection, preservation, and exhibition of items of prehistory, history, and natural history of Fishers Island and through its land trust, the preservation in perpetuity of undeveloped property in its natural state. It is organized for the education and enjoyment of the island community and visitors for the protection of habitat for the island's flora and fauna. I thought you would be interested in that because it echoes so much of the vision and sentiment of the Watch Hill Conservancy. And so we have a lot, a lot in common with Pierce and the Ferguson a Museum of Natural History. And if you ever get out to Fishers, check it out. It's a beautiful facility. As director, Pierce develops and delivers programs to meet the museum mission. He coordinates a summer lecture series, much like Landfear Live. He offers a children's education program on the island and creates an annual exhibition for the museum. The exhibitions are fantastic, and they can all be found on the museum website. I would really urge you to check it out. They're, they're phenomenal. This year, the exhibition is a historic photo chronicle of winters on Fishers Island. Last year, it was Fishers Island Natural History, and the year before that, it was a, the story of the coastal forts in eastern Long Island Sound. The section on Fort Mansfield on the tip of Napa Tree is the best history I have ever seen of our Fort Mansfield. It's really worth um, visiting the site and checking out the uh, Fort exhibition. As you're going to learn tonight, Pierce Rafferty is a master storyteller and an expert historian. He's been at this for a long time. 
In 1984, Pierce founded the company Petrified Films in New York City and spent a decade preserving and archiving old films. He not only collected films, he told stories with them. The 1982 film classic documentary Atomic Cafe, a statement on the perils of nuclear warfare, was co-produced by Pierce. In 2016, Atomic Cafe was inducted into the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress and recognized as being culturally and historically or aesthetically significant. Pierce will give us a short history of Fisher's Island. You'll see why he is a master of the visual arts, history, and storytelling. Please join me in welcoming Pierce Rafferty. All right, um, I do want to say one thing before I start, uh, just to clarify one, one detail, uh, because I know the promotion for this talk had me a resident of fishery since I was six months old. Yes, that was the first time I was there, but basically I start off as a summer resident of Fishers, now called Seasonal. We've changed that name along the way and went back and forth. I was there pretty much through my teen years, then went as far away as possible as I could. Then uh, after I moved back to Manhattan in the 80s, rediscovered the joys of Fishers, got involved with the museum, then 9-11, I was living right next to the towers and moved to Fishers in December 2001, where I've been since then and became the director of the museum in that period. So I, 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 the people on the island are very careful about who's a, who's a resident, who's, a, who's seasonal, who's summer, who's this. So I wanted to just clarify that. I would be what you would call a hybrid in the end, a mixture, former, summer, current, year round, but somewhere in between. So let's, let's go on from there. So Fisher's Island has a long-standing reputation of being at best neutral and at worst hostile to the outside world. There's no doubt that visits by uninvited drop-ins such as day trippers and boaters are made much more, much more burdensome by the lack of almost all available amenities. The island has for decades unofficially kept itself in a sustained state of self-sacrificial service denial, and today <laughs> offers no hotel rooms for rent, no B&Bs, no taxis or Uber, very few public bathrooms, and perhaps most tellingly, even at the height of the season, only one restaurant. For most of the year, none. Although unstated, attractions that might pull in the outside world are just understood to be verboten. Today's talk examines Fisher's Island's history through the prism of its quest to remain private and whenever possible, almost invisible to the wider world. Shakespeare's famous quote from the Tempest seen here engraved in stone outside the National Archives in Washington, DC, could be the subtitle of this talk. Many of the unique qualities and quirks that define Fisher's Island and complicate our sometimes cantankerous relations with our mainland neighbors on both sides of the sound can be traced to the policies and practices and decrees of yesteryear. To understand the origins of our public relations and lack thereof, we have to look back in time to the historical events that helped shape them. We have to uncover exactly how Fisher's Island evolved into a privacy-obsessed, outsider-phobic, quasi-barony attached to a remote town. Our history sets the stage long before we become the recipients of a relatively recent rash of opinions about Fisher's Island that were themselves shaped by the contours of that stage. Here is the history, including some unavoidable boilerplate that provides the foundational setting for today's story. Dutch explorer and fur trader, Captain Adrian Block is credited with being the first European to discover Fisher's Island during his voyage of 1613-14. He literally gave the world its first outside view on a manuscript map issued after his voyage. On it, Fisher's Island has a prominence out of proportion to its actual size that features an eye-catching dark red outline. However, despite this initial attention, the Dutch do not settle Fisher's Island, the English do. 
In the 1640s, John Winthrop Jr., the son of the founder of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, obtained title to the island from multiple sources, a strategy dictated by the region's unsettled boundary lines. I shall generally refer to Winthrop Jr. as more simply Winthrop for the balance of this talk. Winthrop spent just one winter on Fisher's Island with his family in 1646-47 before moving to the mainland in the spring. There he established his main residence on the west bank of the Pequot River, today's Thames River, and founded the town now known as New London. Operating from his base on the mainland, he established an absentee-owned livestock farm on his island property, initially raising horses and goats, but soon shifting to sheep, cattle, and dairy operations. The question most frequently asked about Fisher's Island is, why part of New York? It doesn't make sense in ways both large and small, from our ferry traffic to our zip code to the preponderance of our commerce, we are umbilically linked to Connecticut. The origins of this odd situation can be traced to 1657 when Winthrop became the first colonial governor of Connecticut. After Charles II assumed the English throne in 1660, Winthrop traveled to London where he successfully obtained a royal charter for Connecticut from the king in 1662. Unfortunately, the boundaries of the colony were loosely, almost casually defined. For the purposes of this talk, the southern boundary is the most important. The charter defined Connecticut on the south by the sea and included specific references to the islands adjoining belonging to Connecticut, whose authorities construed this to mean that Connecticut now stretched southward through Long Island Sound across Long Island to the ocean's edge. Unfortunately for Connecticut, the boundary lines became hopelessly tangled in March 1664 when Charles II issued a sweeping patent that created New York and granted it to the Duke of York, who was his brother James. The document included the detail that all of Long Island was now part of New York. There was no easy way to square the circle. Long Island couldn't belong to both New York and Connecticut, and yet both held infallible royal decrees that gave them valid claim to all or part of it. Winthrop had to assume the daunting responsibility of negotiating the boundaries of a much diminished Connecticut, seen here in center right in light yellow, with a king's commission that had been sent to end unneighborly and unbrotherly contentions. In the ensuing negotiations, Winthrop succeeded in restoring Connecticut's right to the western half of its colony, a considerable achievement. However, the king's commission determined that the sea referred to in Connecticut's charter was actually the sound, not the ocean beyond the south shore of Long Island. So presto, Connecticut's southern boundary shrank to its own shoreline, and New York gained control of not only all of Long Island, but also all the offshore islands, including Fisher's Island, despite its proximity to the Connecticut shore. Although Winthrop accepted the loss because of the specificity of the Duke's patent, the colony of Connecticut felt robbed and emphatically did not accept the ruling. Its southern boundary remained unsettled and in dispute for more than two centuries, forming the basis for ongoing contention over and with Fisher's Island, its tantalizingly close island neighbor. In the wake of the ruling in 1664, John Winthrop Jr., Governor John Winthrop Jr. of Connecticut, the founder and owner of Fisher's Island, was in the awkward position of having to apply to Governor Richard Nichols of New York for title to an island he had already owned for two decades. However, Nichols not only gave Winthrop title but he made Fisher's Island a manor, and Winthrop became Lord of the Manor of Fisher's Island as part of New York. Now, as Lord of the Manor, Winthrop, seen at center bottom, answered to no one except the king, seen on left, and God beyond, seen at top. No constable from Connecticut could arrest someone on the island. Manorial status was neo-feudal and designed to bond its recipients to the king, and to create bulwarks of loyalty to the crown. The island became an entire and franchised township, manor, and place of itself. As one historian summed it up, somewhat whimsically, no dog but a Winthrop's had the right to bark there. The granting of manorial status to John Winthrop defined Fisher's Island as a place apart, a place unto itself, as it largely remains to this day. Manorial status also had the effect of making the island an entailed estate that would be passed down undivided within the Winthrop family on the male line for more than two centuries. 
centuries. This manorial status was technically swept away by the Revolutionary War, but don't be fooled, its effects still linger to this day. Despite other attempts by Connecticut to reclaim Fisher's Island in the late 1670s, we remain a detached and distant part of New York, specifically part of the town of Southold, located in Suffolk County, Long Island, seen here at lower left. It is worth noting that from the mid-1600s to the mid-1800s, there was no permanent population on Fisher's Island beyond the farmers and farm families brought in by the person or persons who leased the entire island from the Winthrops. Each group of tenants and subtenants left after the lease expired and were replaced by the next group brought in by the next lessee. At other times, Winthrop farm managers and workers ran the island's farms directly for the Winthrops. There were only a handful of people from the mainland who had reason to notice us at all. We were a private offshore farm generating almost no news of the day. However, the historical record indicates we were visited on occasion, for example, in 1671 by George Fox, the distinguished founder of the Society of Friends, better known as the Quakers. He wrote of his visit, we went in a sloop and passing by Point Judah and Block Island, we came to Fisher's Island, where at night we went on shore, but we're not able to stay for the mosquitoes, which abound there and are very troublesome. He also described being exceedingly wet from an abundance of rain while anchored off the island in his open sloop. Not exactly a rave Yelp review. <laughs> Beginning in the late 1700s, however, people on the mainland got increasing amounts of information about Fisher's Island from the press. Readers knew the products from its farms that were for sale, they read accounts of ships wrecked or stranded on Fisher's Island that included details of lost cargoes. Oh, and there were also occasional stories of drowning victims from the mainland drifting ashore on Fisher's and fantastical accounts of sea monsters, including those found dead on Fisher's or sighted in the surrounding waters. But primarily, people on the mainland knew that Fisher's Island was a place that was off limits, private. The fact that they were not welcome was spelled out in published, posted notices. These notices warned people against coming to the island for amusement purposes, no picnicking allowed, no fishing allowed, no swimming allowed. It was the Revolutionary War that put Fishers on the map and onto the pages of the colonial press in a more significant way, while at the same time accentuating the perception of the island as detached and hostile territory. Due to considerable British activity on and around the island throughout the war, including three enemy raids, that seized desperately needed food and supplies, we morphed from being a relatively benign posted property to being perceived as an enabler of enemy operations and a sort of no man's land useful for illegal trading, exchanging of prisoners, etc. Please note that the first of the British raids on Fisher's Island undertaken in 1775 was successful despite the issuance of a letter of warning from Washington whose spies had informed him of the British plan Unfortunately, General Washington was confused as to who had jurisdiction over Fishers, and his warning was sent in error to the governor of Rhode Island, and therefore was never received locally. Throughout the 1700s, the, specifically the late 1700s, Fishers Island was closely associated with smugglers trying to hide contraband, coastal <coughs> traders with cargoes from the West Indies and European ports, regularly used warehouses and shacks on the island to stash illicit goods and avoid customs. And then there was further difficulty in 1788, after the end of the war, a broadside was widely circulated in the press that Fisher's Island was being used to offload convicts from British jails who were then let loose on the mainland. The linking of these convicts to Fisher's in the press did nothing to enhance our already diminished reputation in the neighborhood. During the War of 1812, our function was uh, to be used as anchoring and staging area for British naval vessels that were patrolling the Sound, seizing American shipping, and bottling up the American fleet in New London. And the ships were anchored off the west end of the island for much of the war. So you can see our reputation was not building in the neighborhood so far. <laughs> Following the war, the farms on Fisher's Island went through a period of economic decline. An article in 1859 in the Homestead Magazine documented the all but abandoned farms 
The writer railed against the Winthrop owners who had in successive generations stripped the island of its natural resources, overgrazed the land, and generally run the island into the ground. A few years later, in 1863, the last of the Winthrop owners sold a heavily mortgaged, all but abandoned island to a wealthy retired merchant named Robert Ralston Fox of New York, ending more than two centuries of Winthrop ownership. If mainlanders expected the underdeveloped property to be opened up by land sales, they were sorely disappointed. Surprising all concerned, Mr. Fox decided to become a gentleman farmer and worked for the remaining eight years of his life on a project restoring the island as a great livestock farm with up to 2,400 sheep and 500 prized cattle. He kept the island intact, private, and off limits to the public. However, there were days that defied the norm. On the morning of April 8, 1867, Mr. Fox had every expectation of another quiet, crime-free morning on his bucolic island. It was not to be, with no warning. Several hundred men offloaded from two large schooners anchored near North Hill, seen in left background, threw up a prize ring and staged a major bare-knuckle heavyweight, uh, heavyweight prize fight between an Englishman and an Irishman. I believe a Cast Iron Man was one of the prize fighters, and I forget the other man's name, but $1,000 purse in 1867 dollars. At the time, prize fights were illegal in most of America, especially on the East Coast, and were considered magnets of criminality. So Fisher's Island was a perfect venue for a furtive big fight, as it was, in effect, subject to no law that could be enforced in a timely manner and was legally beyond the reach of mainland authorities. Uh, I want to mention this, this illustration, although I would like to believe it was done of a fight on Fisher's Island. Probably took place in England, to tell you the truth. But it's a beautiful picture, and it does illustrate the concept. Speaking of criminality, after the untimely death of Robert Fox in 1871, various speculative proposals for the future of the island bubbled to the surface. The most outrageous was a plan for the outright purchase of the island by the state of New York for the purpose of moving Sing Sing prison to our shores, lock, stock, and barrel. Needless to say, we did not become Alcatraz East, but the plan was thoroughly debated in the New York State Legislature. Next, the Fox estate tried to auction uh, Fishers as a series of farms. The auction was held in 1875 in Riverhead. Pl prices were not realized, no lot sold. It's interesting to note that at the time, the auction's property uh, list had only seven houses on all of Fishers Island uh, in 1875. We were truly underdeveloped, and the island is under 3,000 acres, but still seven houses, very few. A Stonington-based businessman tried to interest a group of mainland investors in a plan to lay a trolley line down the spine of the island that would link summer colonies associated with various mainland cities. When that ambitious plan failed to attract funding, Mrs. Fox, the widow, and the Fox estate executor took development matters into their own hands by offering land lots for direct sale to the public. These sales opened up the island to the outside world for the first time since first settlement in the 1640s. Many mainland residents purchased land lots and established a foothold on what had been forbidden territory for centuries. All sales were restricted by the Fox estate to the west end of the island, the western one-third. A small town quickly formed because it could, and within in a decade there was a church, two hotels, a boarding house, a general store, and both winter and summer communities. Small excursion ferries brought people to the boutique-sized Mansion House Hotel, the former Fox residence that became Fisher's Island's first destination. It's seen at upper left. By the early 1880s, during the season, large side wheelers carried hundreds of day excursionists to the new Lyles Beach Hotel, seen at lower right, that was located on the approach to West Harbor, our main harbor. During this period, the paddle steamer Julia ran from westerly Rhode Island to Lyles Beach on a regular schedule. The paddle steamer Ella, originating in Norwich, made many stops on its circular route, including at Lyles Beach on Fishers and at Watch Hill. There was considerable political agitation during this period for Connecticut and New York to finally settle their age-old disputed boundary lines. In 1878, a joint commission was set up to arbitrate the issue with three appointed commissioners representing each state. In 1879, the 
committee reached a compromise that yielded 2,600 acres from Connecticut to New York on the north-south oblong, and that's running up the western boundary, not the protuberance, but running up the western boundary in that narrow band. In exchange for getting those acres in the oblong, New York allowed Connecticut's southern boundary to move offshore to the middle of the sound. As for Fishers Island, the committee decided to jog the line north, to leave it as part of New York, because under familiar principles of law, New York then held the title and had maintained the actual possession of it for more than a century. The record suggests that it was left as part of New York only because it was too big a prize to wrap into the compromise. Connecticut had nothing left to easily trade for it. So the boundary lines were formally ratified in 1880 by the two state assembly, leaving Fishers Island as part of New York. However, the bitterness on the Connecticut side seemed to grow, not subside in the wake of the settlement. There were new attempts, uh, including by the town of Stonington, to try to annex Fishers Island on its own. In the midst of all this hubbub, almost as a quiet of side, the New York Tribune reported that the inhabitants of the island unanimously preferred to remain a part of Suffolk County, New York. In 1884, the Fox Estate leased the eastern two-thirds of the island to a gun club whose members were prominent sportsmen from the New York metropolitan area. In many ways, the gun club's arrival marks the entry of an elite class to the growing community on Fishers Island. The club members had exclusive rights to fish and hunt over some 2,000 acres, an area roughly equivalent to today's private East End that we'll discuss in a moment. The new restrictions rankled many on the island and on the mainland who less than a decade before had finally gained a degree of access to all parts of the island. And then in June of 1889, two prominent uh, banking brothers, uh, Edmund and Walton Ferguson, bought nine-tenths of Fisher's Island from the Fox Estate, a tract that included everything on the island except the 101 land lots at the West End that had been sold in that initial development period. Their development plan was to create a resort that catered to an exclusive seasonal clientele. Immediately, they began searching for ways to create privacy barriers to buffer their resort. Within four months of their purchase, they had hired lawyers to examine the original Winthrop Memorial Grant to see if privileges and rights set forth therein, including those relating to hunting and fishing, could be restored and used to control access on and around Fisher's Island. The New London Day reported in January 1890, somewhat bemusedly, quote, the Messrs. Ferguson, the new proprietors of Fisher's Island, have issued a notice that all seaweed cast ashore, all seaweed growing on the rocks, all fish in the ponds and in the water surrounding Fisher's Island, all wild beasts and birds inhabiting it are theirs, and no one will be allowed to gather the seaweed or to hunt the fish without prosecution unless they first obtain permission. Property owners on the island do not relish this ironclad proclamation, end quote. The seaweed was wanted for the Fergusons as fertilizer for the island farms. Later that year, to provide a more certain exclusionary zone blocking access to the shoreline, the Fergusons applied to the land office in Albany and purchased for a dollar an acre 907 acres of underwater land surrounding Fisher's Island and adjacent islands. They were striving to return Fisher's Island to a privacy level not seen since the Winthrop and early Fox periods. At the same time, having successfully bought out the Lyles Beach Shore Hotel, the tourist hotel, in 1891, the so-called Coney Island of the East, E.M. and W. Ferguson promptly shut it down, eventually renovating it into a more elegant hotel, and issued a decree that banished excursion steamers from landing on Fisher's Island, something they could do because they owned all the landings. The decree also promised that their purchase of underwater land would protect the citizens of the island from all possible annoyances. From the perspective of the mainland, the access gates had slammed firmly shut again. 1891 marks the end of the brief tourist period on Fishers Island that lasted only from the time of first land sales in December 1876 to the early 1890s, approximately 15 years, <clears throat> a very small stretch of time when you consider that we are now almost 380 years distant from first settlement. Relations with the mainland took a turn for the worse on September 20, 1893, 
when two Ferguson employees tried to intercept and arrest two men who had removed a boatload of seaweed from below the high water mark on Fisher's Island. In the course of trying to make the arrest, the superintendent of the island fired shots that narrowly missed the two seaweed harvesters. Now, mainland newspaper accounts were understandably very sympathetic to the harvesters, as most people would be. At first, I was puzzled how the Ferguson brothers could have allowed this public relations disaster to occur, but it did subsequently dawn on me, and I'm surprised I didn't notice this from the beginning, that there wouldn't have been a public relations department at the EM&W Ferguson Company because they were actively striving to have no relations with the public. <laughs> Having conquered the threat of unwanted visitation by excursionists, hunters, fishermen, seaweed harvesters, the Ferguson family spent the next two decades building infrastructure and improving their two major hotels, all the while successfully operating their new seasonal resort. In the mid-1920s, with the resort firmly established on the West End, a new privacy layer was added to the island when the second generation of Ferguson owners initiated a development that transformed the eastern two-thirds of the island into a private gated residential colony. The East End's farms were all shut down to clear the way for the new development. The development is referred to as the Olmsted Plan because Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., son of the famous designer of Central Park and member of the same legendary firm, did the lot plan. During this period, a who's who of American business bought land lots within the private East End colony and began <coughs> constructing summer homes. And that's uh, Grant Simmons' uh, grandfather's castle at Upper Wright. And this uh, development was off to a very strong start with more than 45 substantial residences completed or under construction when the crash of 29 shook the resort on Fishers Island to its core and land sales screeched to a halt within the boundaries of the residential colony. And the entire development was dependent on those land, land sales. Had the crash not occurred, Fishers Island would not be the underdevelopment resort it is considered today. The Fergusons were planning for over 400 houses in their residential colony. Today, 100 years later, there are only a bit more than half that intended number at the private East End. And I always like to say at some point in every talk that it was the crash that put the Olmstead back in the Olmstead plan and stopped an overdevelopment. Throughout the ensuing depression, no matter the degree of economic disruption, the resort's overriding concern with privacy remained quite constant. By this time, the maintenance of privacy and its flip side, the blocking of all unwanted publicity, were both baked into the island's DNA. From the extreme reaction to breaches of privacy in the 50s, 60s, and in more recent decades, one could conclude that the generating of unwanted publicity is as close to an original sin as there is on Fishers. However, it's a misconception that all publicity was forbidden. Outsiders who were members of society or who read the magazines that catered to it did have ongoing access to images and stories of daily life and activities within the gated community on Fishers Island as portrayed in the society pages of newspapers and publications like Town and Country, The Sportsman, and Country Life. With narrow targeted readership, these upper class oriented magazines posed absolutely no threat and were useful for overall remote resort promotion. The annual Springer Spaniel dog trials held at Fishers each fall were particularly well covered beginning in the mid 20s until the trials left the island in the late 40s. There were also feature articles about the new Fishers Island uh, Club golf course and clubhouse at the East End and much coverage of the annual horse shows on Middle Farms Flats that were held in the late 20s and early 30s and she was already in the talk from an earlier version, but that's uh, Grant's aunt, Frances Simmons, jumping the hurdle at, at right. It's hard to believe today, but during the 1930s, the children's bullseye and dumpling class sailboat races were sometimes covered by the New York Times. Readers could turn away from articles about the rise of fascism in Europe to see which 10-year-old had been triumphant in the Saturday sailboat races at Fishers. Go figure that one. I, I, that just is astounding to me. On occasion, photo news services were granted access to the East End, specifically to the Fishers Island Club, AKA the Big Club, seen here that was completed in 26. 
and the Hay Harbor Club, uh, located at the West End near the Ferguson's Mansion House Hotel. Although rare photos of Fish and Silence Society posing and at play appeared in national and regional newspapers, the captions trumpeted the same byline. This is the first time photographs have been made of society disporting themselves at the fashionable resort on Fisher's Island, end quote. The public had then, as now, enduring fascination with the fashions of the wealthy and the activities of the wealthy. This wildly, widely distributed photo touted it was the first picture showing the newly engaged Fisher's Islander, Ann S. Consolving, and her husband-to-be, John Nicholas Brown, said to be the world's wealthiest bachelor. It was taken at the horse show on Fisher's in 1930. The Ferguson's primary hotel, the Mansion House, received coverage in magazines, but also had its own promotional brochures that were sent out to prospective guests. It's worth noting that in 1935, during the Depression, the hotel's manager wrote to all Fisher's Island Club members, stating that finding the right sort of people to fill the hotel's cottages was our big problem. He encouraged them to recommend the hotel to suitable friends and to send in names of possible cottage renters or potential hotel guests in order to maintain the high standards of the past. He made clear that he needed their help in getting new business because, quite frankly, it was difficult maintaining a restricted clientele policy. This subject is important for this talk because the outside world grew to know Fisher's Island as a restricted WASP-centric resort. And for many, including those who felt excluded or who were actually excluded, that was and remains a defining characteristic. With tourism having been all but eradicated on island 50 years before, it's interesting to note that after a decade of economic reversals caused by the Great Depression, a series of Ferguson-produced ads was published in 1940 that encouraged people to visit by drawing attention to and attempting to dispel their doubts and fears about visiting Fishers. In the follow-up ad, the reader discovered no matter what he or she had originally thought that the island is beautiful and the people on Fishers are actually nice and maybe even welcoming. These ads, almost certainly designed by an ad agency, were placed by the Ferguson's main operating company. And all I can say about that is that a depression can soften rigid policies. Hard on the heels of the depression came World War II, during which life on Fishers came close to a lockdown because of the presence of Fort H.G. Wright, a coastal defense fort built at the turn of the century at the western tip of the island. After a decade of depression and four long years of war, the island's residents felt they were ready for a change. Consequently, from 1945 to 1949, annexation fever broke out again on Fisher's Island. The debate raged on with newspapers covering the story nationwide. When the year-round population finally voted on the issue in 1949, 21 residents voted for annexation by Connecticut. 51 voted against, and most didn't vote at all. Lobstermen had successfully led the fight against joining Connecticut, fearing the loss of the fishing protection zone around the island. There's an amusing moment in this, in this battle between Connecticut and New York where Governor Baldwin of Connecticut writes his counterpart, Governor Dewey of New York, and says, why don't we sit down and settle this? It's really time. I mean, Fisher should belong to Connecticut. It was founded by our people. It, we're connected to it. And Governor Dewey's administrative aide wrote, sent back a me message to, to Governor Baldwin that went basically like this. Absolutely, let's sit down and settle this. But would you do me a favor? Cut off half of Fairfield County, presumably including Greenwich, give it to New York, and then we'll sit down and talk. And, and that remains the rub. This was why we're probably going to remain as we are. There's nothing left to trade for it. Although one wag in the newspapers in a 1967, I believe, annexation attempt wrote, you have it backwards. Connecticut shouldn't annex Fisher's Island. Fisher's Island should annex Connecticut. <laughs> In 1950, an article was published entitled Fisher's Island, Isolation Preferred, that provided evidence that the island had reverted to form in regards to tourism. Quote, the islanders enjoy their privacy and isolation and strive to protect both. They do not want tourists and do nothing to attract them. They're glad to have people feel there's nothing over on Fisher's worth bothering to see, end quote. But Fisher's Islanders somehow let their guard down. Just when all seemed safe and secure again, their privacy barriers were severely breached, not by easily deflected and rejected tourists, 
but by Cleveland Amory, a Harvard-educated writer and journalist who took pleasure in poking fun at the pretensions and customs of society, as his wiki page describes it. He was from society enough that once through the door, he easily moved about Fisher's Island observing and taking note of its mannerisms and traditions. Now here's a sample from his book, Last Resorts. In this first piece, he's referring to both Hope Sound and Fisher's two islands he saw as interchangeable on many levels. Quote, when the resorters themselves are visible, it's immediately apparent that despite small cottages, dirt roads, and other misleading externals, the majority of these resorters are so extremely well off that nobody tries to impress anybody with money. Instead, they impress each other with their home equalities. This keeping down with the Joneses in such select areas where there are no Joneses to keep down to is no easy task, but both islands do their level best. Men rarely dress for dinner, and women go in heavily for the dirndl and the peasant motif. For more formal attire, all ladies of Fishers and Hove wear what amounts to a uniform, a well-cut shantung or linen dress, which is topped off by a cashmere cardigan sweater, the latter quietly but healthily jeweled, is always worn casually over one's shoulders. A lady putting her arms actually in her cardigan is socially suspect." <laughs> End quote. He also told the story of a baron who landed by mistake on Fishers after a cross-Atlantic solo sail in the boat pictured here. The baron is at right. The following passages are excerpts from Amory's account of his accidental landing in 46. Quote, even more remarkable was the arrival off Fishers during the summer of 1946 of Baron Hans de Meistufen of Zurich, Switzerland. The Baron, who had sailed all alone from Casablanca in a 32-foot yawl, had just completed the fastest east-west solo sailing passage ever made. Since he could not see water on the other side of Fishers, and since his chart did not show Fishers at all, the Baron thought he'd hit New London. Anchoring his boat, he quickly paddled here in an inflatable rubber dinghy, still dressed in his sailing uniform, a one-piece Annette Kellerman bathing suit with a Swiss emblem on it. Unfortunately, he had not only hit Fisher's Island instead of New London, he had also hit the island at its most forbidding spot, the Club Beach, at its most forbidding possible time, the fashionable bathing hour of high noon, end quote. Amory reported, that the sailor, as he reached the beach, received no hero's welcome, in fact, no welcome at all. However, a Swiss governess, who was protectively shielding her charges from the strange man who emerged from the sea, recognized the emblem on the bathing suit. A conversation confirmed that he was indeed a baron. So she promptly, quote unquote, spread the good word. Amory wrote, quote, Immediately, Fisherites crowded around and led by Greenwich's Mrs. J. Williams Moore Robbins gave the Baron a royal welcome. She said, says the Baron today with a wry smile, that glad she was I had that day come because it happened that she was an extra man short for lunch. <laughs> I find that line one of my favorites. So much truth in that line. <laughs> All right. The next biggest breach of privacy after Amory's last resorts was an article published in, of all places, Sports Illustrated in 1965 entitled Island of the Discreet Shudder. I vividly remember my father clutching this magazine and muttering out loud, how could this have happened? Here are a few excerpts from Boyle's Island of the Discreet Shudder. To Fisherites, the worst disaster ever to hit the island was not the 1938 hurricane, but the 1951 visit of Amory, who came over to scout the good life for a chapter in one of his books. Although Amory was generally complimentary, Fisherites were so incensed at being done up in print that they promptly exiled the chap who had invited him over. Quote, we don't want any publicity, the Reverend Dr. Arthur Lee Consolving, rector of Posh St. James in New York, and a uh, confirmed Fisherite says with a discreet shudder, publicity ruined Newport and Bar Harbor, end quote. Another passage, for the big rich, Fishers is also a place where their children can grow up and meet and eventually marry their own kind. Any number of summer romances have blossomed into matrimony capped by the inevitable Lester Lynn and Wingding and the interlocking kinship between some families is enough to befuddle the most dedicated genealogist as a mating ground, Fisher's is a sort of Episcopal Grossinger's. 
<laughs> and one more excerpt from Discreet Shutter. In the summer, the chief native recreation is to watch the ferries to and from New London. It's something to see, says a native. It's darling this and darling that. Another adds, I, I'd never miss the Labor Day ferry. There are the chauffeurs, the dogs, the children, the luggage. You'd think with, with all that carrying on, they'd at least be going to Europe instead of New London, just 40 minutes away. So this, this, this article by Island Summer resident Anthony West, the son of H.G. Wells and Dame Rebecca West, was so riddled with acerbic observations and rapid fire backhanded critiques that it's easy to believe that the powers that be on Fishers provided him with a list of bullet points designed to keep the outside world at bay by making Fishers absolutely unattractive. West described the island as an eroded ridge of gravel and granite remarkable for its lack of scenic distinction. Only poison ivy and recalcitrant vines grow really well there. Its climate was like, like that of the Rockaways. Now that must have stung. And its houses stood in clearings of unimproved scrub. There's some truth to some of this. The beaches were all mediocre. And as for its two golf courses, one of which was then, was then and still is quite celebrated, West wrote, quote, if the two golf courses are among the least enterprising on the Atlantic coast, all continents like that, they are also heaven for the sort of duffer who likes to play his own game in his own way when he feels like it, end quote. He concluded this remarkable uh, diatribe on an up note about the island being a good place to spend a few idle weeks with old friends. But this was uh, faint praise indeed. And then since the 60s, there have been many more magazine, newspaper articles, including W Spread, featuring Fishers as a snob spot. Uh, there was also an ap a atmospheric visual essay published in Vogue that featured a mysterious model wafting about the Hay Arbor Club and posing right side up and upside down in a neighboring house. And she entered a trance of, uh, whoops, she entered a trance of sorts that remained intact no matter what clothes she displayed in the club's bathhouse. And I believe Fisher's Island's own Polly Mellon, a celebrated editor for more than 60 years at Harper's Bazaar and Vogue, arranged this shoot. And then we did have a visit from Hollywood in 1981 during a production of World According to Garp, starring Robin Williams, Glenn Close, Glenn Close and John Lithgow. And it featured the Wilmerding substantial summer cottage. And we do have a reputation for shunning celebrity, really harshly a little bit. But in the case of this Warner Brothers production, the crew and stars were welcomed and Many islanders had bit roles as extras in the, in the movie, so maybe the economics helped smooth the way. Here's another photo of Robin Williams with some island kids. This town and country article I always like to mention because it described Fisher's Island as a low-lying eight-mile smudge off the Connecticut shore where strangers arrive by yacht or by marriage. <laughs> Some, tr some truth to that as well. So um, one article that triggered a lot of imitators was Jesse Kornbluth's We Happy Few. There have been a lot of different versions with this, this sort of theme. Um, not much to say about that. It's gotten to the point where er the very name Fisher's Island has been used in advertising and books as a humor-infused thought trigger to simultaneously invoke, celebrate, and parody old money, exclusivity, and blue-bloodedness. A classic example is the J. Peterman ad for Fisher's Island Searsucker Skirt Number 1655, and this ad for Old Money Shirt Number 1817. <laughs> I prefer this ad also from a J. Peterman catalog. The associated text for this ad begins, The Old Money Club. May we put in a word for the much-bashed wasp? Industry conscience, civic-mindedness, a wholehearted belief at best in the level playing field. Those aren't bad things and neither are the clothes. These shirts, for example, the kind favor for casual wear by Skull and Bones members with very little summer places on Fisher's Island, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> a number of novels have been published in the last decade where Fisher's Island plays either a minor role, occasionally a major one, and they vary from beach read tossaways to well-crafted no novels like Celine. And then Fisher's pops up in a slightly distorted form as a featured map in this major Hollywood movie, and no one has been able to tell me why. It's, it was just there on screen. Uh, no, no context at all having to do with Fisher's. 
And those who watch the popular TV show Mad Men know full well that the parents of the somewhat swarmy but altogether compelling ad exec Pete Campbell, seen here, had a summer place on Fishers, you may have. And then this, this is a little bit more of a, 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 a humor infused but somewhat serious piece. Tony Award and Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Wendy Wasserstein wrote a very funny short story in which she uh, discovers that she's actually an Episcopalian. And uh, here's the ending of that story that picks up just after she'd been told her new denominational truth by a newly discovered relative. Good or bad news had always made me hungry, but for the first time in my life, I needed a drink. Maybe she, the woman who had told her the news, was onto something. That week, I began eating chicken sandwiches with mayo on white bread, no crust, and getting full after two bites. For the first time in my life, I rode into the Mount Holy Holyoke Quarterly and looking to buy a 30-year-old Saab car and to apologize to all the Holyoke girls named Timothy and Kiki, whom I never spoke to, I now know you were very interesting people. I began with, uh, wearing faded cardigan sweaters and canceled all appointments for massages, pedicures, and exploratory liposuction. I gave up on my complicated relationship with a married Jewish Malaysian vibes player and learned to enjoy the company of a divorced asexual friend from Amherst who studies pharmaceutical stocks for J.P. Morgan. I began running 10 miles every morning and sculling down the Hudson Knightley. My approval ratings from my friends had gone up 15 points. But as I, I was still, as I used to say in Yiddish, nit ahin, not nit eher, or as I now say in the Queen's English, neither here nor there. That was when I decided to go on a listening tour of Fisher's Island. I wanted to really hear the stories of my new wasp ancestors, learn to make their cocktails and wear their headbands. I want to live up to my true destiny and announce to the world how great it is to be Goyesha like me." End quote. In a public opinion column published in New London's newspaper The Day in 2011, New Londoner Peter Roberts announced he was not running for mayor, but if he did, he would win in a landslide. Promising to be a benevolent despot, he revealed his platform. My strong mayor rule would begin with the annexation of Fisher's Island. The residents of this moated community need to join the real world, and there's no better place to start than our hip little city. Welcome to New London. Meanwhile, New London's homeless would be shipped off to a few mansions on New London's newly acquired Fisher's Island, taken by eminent domain. I would transfer the island into a luxury spa for the indigent and vacationers. The ferry to the island would be free, end quote. Now, I actually think he would have gotten a fair number of votes. I don't think he would have won, but it would have been interesting to see. But that, too, is neither here nor there. In closing, I want to say that I hope I've given you a better sense of how outside views of Fisher's Islands were and are formed yesterday and today, and also an understanding of how deeply ingrained and historically based our ongoing quest for privacy is. Thank you. Now, I always... I always put this slide up, but people are confused whether I'm the one who's talked myself to death or whether you are collectively on the, ca on the, uh, ca on the whatever they call it, the, the canvas. Gurney. 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 Well, can't be expected to remember everything, can I?